Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. Kevin, future speaker. <laughs> so, hello, welcome to Astronomy on Top number eight. I am Anna Mikler, I'm a PhD student uh, from the Arkelander Institute for Astronomy. And today with Laila, I will be doing the moderation for the event. And we're very happy to have you here. Yeah, guten Abend, auch von mir. <laughs> ich bin Laila, ich bin Doktorandin am Wagelander Institut und heute zusammen mit Anna Moderatorin hier. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so let me tell you about a bit about Astronomy on Tap. Astronomy on Tap started in New York City as an initiative from professional astronomers to tell the general audience about beautiful things on the sky. And The idea is to do it in a pub where you can have a bite, a pint, relax, enjoy a friendly atmosphere, ask all the questions possible. You can see where it started. And right now it's a worldwide event. Recently I read that we will have around a thousand events around the world of Astronomy Tab, so that's great. Uh, this is the chapter for Bonn. This is number eight. And we are very happy to be here. We want to thank the audience, of course, the speakers, the team. It's a team of around 10 people who make a lot of effort to put this here. And Fiddlers for allowing us to be here. Ja, Astronomy on Tap ist ein weltweites Phänomen, gestartet in New York von Astronomen, die gerne ihre Wissenschaft dem weiteren Publikum zu, äh, präsentieren wollten. Und ähm, ja, dafür gibt es keine bessere Atmosphäre als hier in einem Pub. Ähm, wir möchten uns gerne bei Fitless bedanken, dass wir hier sein dürfen, beim äh, ganzen Team, das bei der Orga geholfen hat, bei unseren Vortragenden heute natürlich. Ähm, ja, vielen, vielen herzlichen Dank und darauf ein Herzliches Prost. Prost. Cheers. Yamas. Yamas. And so Astronomy on Tap Bonn happens the last Tuesday of every month here at Fiddlers. It's always at 7 p.m. and it lasts around two hours. Today will be a record and we're going to do it super on time. It's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, Astronomy on Tap Bonn findet immer am letzten Dienstag von jedem Monat statt, immer um 7 Uhr hier im Fiddlers Pub und äh, heute sind wir hoffentlich besonders on time, damit jeder danach auch auf seine Partys gehen kann. Ja, yep. uh, the format that we're going to have today is a talk, a quiz, then we're going to have the break and then another talk and then super special talk after that. Genau, wie immer haben wir heute einen deutschen Vortrag, einen englischen Vortrag, dazwischen ein ganz, ganz tolles Quiz und am Ende sogar noch einen ganz Spezialgast, einen Überraschungsgast für einen kleinen Astro Slam. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask the astronomers in the audience. There is always a bunch of them. You can write us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, send us an email. You can also write on the chat of YouTube if you're watching this from home. Um, which also remind me that we have streamed this event. Uh, it's a live event on YouTube, so if you don't want to be seen, you know, uh, on the chat or in the stream, then don't come on the stage. The general area of the stage is always visible. Uh, which also means that we will have it on on the breaks. So if you don't want to be seen, don't come at any time here. But otherwise come. <laughs> ja, wenn ihr Fragen habt zur Astronomie und mal so einen richtigen Astronomen mit Fragenlöchern wollt, hier haben einige hier, die sich im Publikum versteckt haben. Äh, erkennt ihr gut an den, an den Namensschildern. Und es gibt auch ein paar, die keine Namensschildern habt. Aber stellt gerne eure Fragen, kommt auf uns zu. Ähm, wir sind auch auf allen sozialen Medien vertreten, könnt ihr uns gerne auch abonnieren, folgen oder ähm, anderweitig kontaktieren oder auch eine E-Mail schreiben. Ähm, wir haben auch einen Livestream von unserem Event, von jedem Event haben wir einen Livestream ähm, auf YouTube, äh, für den wir auch gerade filmen. Also hallo alle, die im Livestream zuschauen. Ähm, darum kurze Erinnerung an alle, wenn ihr nicht gefilmt werden wollt, dann kommt bitte nicht hier in den Bühnenbereich. Ja. So. If you're wondering where the other astronomers are, the corner table there. That's the one you can, the ones making noise. Those ja. are the ones you can ask. Also die richtigen Astronomen, die erkennt ihr daran, dass sie gerade nicht zuhören und ein bisschen Lärm machen. Also da hinten ist der Tisch mit den Astronomen. Perfect. So without further ado, we have our first talk of the day with Dr. Alexandra Roy. Uh, she studied astronomy in Bologna and then she moved to Bonn in 1999 at work at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy and at the Bonn Institute for the Institute for Geodesics. That's correct, right? Yeah, geodesic. And then since in 2010, she obtained her PhD. And since 2017, she has been working at the DLR. And today she's going to tell us about Sophia, 
which is a flying observatorium, which sounds very cool. Ja, unser erster Vortrag ist auf Deutsch von Dr. Alessandra Roy. Sie hat äh, in Bologna in Italien Astronomie studiert und seit 1999 ist sie schon in Bonn. Erst arbeitete sie am Max-Planck-Institut äh, für Radioastronomie, ähm, dann auch an der Uni Bonn im Institut für Geodäsie und Geoinformation und ähm, seit 2017 arbeitet sie am DLR äh, und heute redet sie über Sophia, ein fliegendes Observatorium, ein, ein sehr, sehr spannendes Thema. Also ein ganz, ganz großer Applaus für Dr. Alessandra Roy. Okay. Vielen Dank. Ähm, wie viele von euch sind eigentlich nicht Astronomen? Also, okay, wie viele sind keine Astronomen hier drin? Ganz wenig. <lacht> okay, naja, fangen wir an. Astrologin nicht, geht es nicht. So, was ist Sophia? Sophia ist eine 747, eine 747 Special Performance und wie man sieht, hat ein Loch hier hinten. Das ist modifiziert und zwar drin haben wir ein Teleskop. Ähm, diese Flugzeug hat erste, ist das erste Mal geflogen vor Pan Am in 1977 äh, und fliegt jetzt äh, das erste Mal mit dem ähm, wissenschaftlichen Flug. Seit Dezember 2010 war das erste Mal, dass geflogen ist mit einem wissenschaftlichen Flug. Sophia ist eine Kooperation zwischen DLA und NASA. NASA hat den Flugzeug selbst und DLA treibt den Teleskop und hat auch die Teleskop gebaut, zusammen mit deutschen äh, Partner. Ähm, nur einfach eine Kleinigkeit zu geben, das ist nicht ein normale 747, das ist ein bisschen kurzer, das sind nur äh, fast 60 Meter Bandbreite. Normalerweise 747 wäre 70. So, hier den Teleskop besser sehen. Ähm, das ist, wie es aussieht, also das ist äh, die Trennungwand zwischen der Kabine, wo pressurisiert ist und die Leute sitzen, die Wissenschaftler und die Ingenieure sitzen. Und wo das Teleskop eigentlich sieht, draußen, hier auf dieser Seite. Das Teleskop selbst ist 2,7 Meter. Im Vergleich Hubble wäre 2,4, ist 2,4. Die sind drei Spiegel, den Primärspiegel, Sekundärspiegel und Tertiär hier. Da leitet die, Radio die Strahlung durch diese Kanäle hier in den Bereich, wo die Instrumente sind. Das Teleskop selbst, nur einfach ein paar Zahlen zu geben, wiegt 1,7 Tonnen und die Wellenlängebereich ist von 0,3 bis 1600 Mikron. Ähm, Sophia fliegt ungefähr 120 Mal im Jahr. Jeder Flug ist zwischen 8 und 10 Stunden und äh, die Flughöhe ist 14.000 14 Meter. Wieso wollen wir so hoch fliegen? Weil im Wellenlängebereich, das wir decken, ist in Infrarot und das ist nicht von der Erdoberfläche sichtbar. Den Wasserdampf äh, lass uns nicht durchsehen. So wie es aussieht, im Observatorium, nur einfach einen Einblick zu haben. Danach gibt es einen Film, so das wird ein bisschen echter. Äh, hier ist, wo das Teleskop ist, das ist getrennt, ist draußen, hier ist diese grüne Wand wie vorher und hier, wo die Leute sitzen. Das wissenschaftliche Instrument ist da, zurzeit haben wir fünf, die decken verschiedene Wellenlänge, so jede hat ihre wissenschaftlichen äh, Ziele. Ähm, hier sitzen die Ingenieure, sie checken, was ein Teleskop macht, also wie jede Instrumente kann etwas immer passieren. Äh, die Wissenschaftler sitzen da und es gibt es manchmal an Bord auch den PI von den äh, Proposer, das geflogen ist und sie checken die Daten online direkt. Ähm, hier ist okay, Flugplane und so weiter ist ein bisschen mehr aufwendig, weil wir fliegen, wir müssen nicht nur Beobachtungen durchführen, sondern wir müssen auch mit den äh, Security, also mit den anderen Flugzeugen sprechen. Also manchmal sagen sie, sie müssen höher wechseln. Ähm, Steuergeräte, okay, es ist ein Computer, das steuert die ganze Elektronik, aber nur von dem wissenschaftlichen Teil. Und oben haben drei Leute im Cockpit. So viel ist so alt, dass wir brauchen noch den Flugingenieur. Und das, äh, eine tolle Geschichte ist hier, hier oben, es gibt tatsächlich ein kleines Loch, ungefähr so. Und das ist vor dem Sextant. Also sie sind damals geflogen mit dem Sextant. Das kann man mit einem kleinen Hebel offen und dann Sextant offen und dann so fliegen. Da war es so in den 70er Jahren. Jetzt nicht mehr, aber das Loch ist noch da. Und wir haben das letztes Jahr im Dezember entdeckt. Ich wusste es nicht. Da war eine alte Pilot von der Lufthansa, der da wusste. 
Ähm, wir haben schon gesagt, wir sind in der Infrarotbereich. Was ist ein Infrarot? Bedeutet unter dem Rot, also wenn man das ganze Spektrum hier sieht. Denn optische Licht ist hier, wo was wir sehen können. Und oben ist undurchsichtig durch die Atmosphäre. Und das sind die in Richtung Ultraviolett, Röntgen und äh, Gammastrahlung. Und dann hier Richtung Radio. Und wie man sieht, in dem Bereich, wo wir beobachten, es gibt noch ähm, Teile, die nicht sichtbar sind vom Boden. Das heißt, deswegen müssen wir fliegen. Es gibt äh, Teile, die man äh, trotzdem von äh, Mauna Kea, so 4000 Meter oder Chile, 5000 Meter noch sehen kann. Aber wenn wir äh, andere Frequenzen decken wollen, hier und hier, dann müssen wir draußen. Und zwar 14.000 Meter höher oder von Hall. Das wäre noch besser. Dann haben wir keine Linie mehr. So, was ist Infrarot? Infrarot ist Wärme. Also das ist einfach zu zeigen, das ist äh, ein Polarbär und man kann sehen die Temperaturen. Ne? Das äh, in der Gesicht ist dann wärmer und dann ist kälter. Das machen wir das Gleiche natürlich nicht mit Polarbären, sondern mit Sternen oder Ko immer Körper. Ähm, Stratosphäre, habe ich gesagt, Sophia fliegt. Wenn wir, äh, sagen wir, das ist das ein Objekt, das wir sehen möchten. Wenn wir von Mauna Kea das sehen möchten, wie sieht man hier, ist alles dicht. Und zwar, das Wasserdamp äh, macht äh, wie eine Nebel, also ist wie ein Scheinwerfer äh, auf, gegen Nebel. Das sieht man nicht. Aber wenn höher fliegt, also hier 12.000 Meter und wir möchten gerne unsere Target noch höher, das sieht man schon eine ganze Menge mehr. Wir haben noch Linien natürlich, das können wir nicht äh, vermeiden, sie sind da, äh, wir beobachten einfach da nicht. Was macht Sophia? Sophia macht eine jede Menge, also wir machen Sonnensysteme, wir machen auch galaktische Objekte, kein extra, galakt, auch extra galaktisch, aber nah, alles ist nah. Hier zum Beispiel können Planeten haben, jetzt muss ich die Frequenzen lesen, weil ich weiß das nicht mehr. Sorry. Also das ist da... Ja, Sonnensysteme. Also hier ist Jupiter, die sind drei Frequenzen, das sind 5,4 Mikron, 24 Mikron und 37 Mikron, denn 24 wäre noch sichtbar für die Erde, aber die anderen zwei nicht. Zum Beispiel, sie haben mit Sophia die Schumacher-Levy-Komet beobachtet, als er in den Jupiter-Raum gegangen ist. Dann haben sie gesehen, wie die innere äh, Tiefe von einer äh, Planetenatmosphäre ist. Dann können wir Kometen genau beobachten. Also das ist nur ein Beispiel am 31 äh, Mikron. Das sieht man die Temperatur, was wir mit dem Polarbär zu sehen war, so wo sehr hoch ist. Und dann könnte die Temperatur und andere Parameter messen. Wir machen Astrochemie. Das hier zum Beispiel ist denn, äh, eine, eine Moleküle, das ist äh, Deuterium und, äh, äh, und Sauerstoff. Das ist äh, sehr schwierig, das Moleküle zu bilden und jetzt ist zu verstehen, wieso ist da und was äh, ist äh, zu machen. Wir können planetarische Nebel beobachten, also die Sterne, die äh, quasi gestorben sind und, äh, oder werden sterben. Wir können galaktische Zentrum, das ist jetzt... Äh, ähm, was Sophia sieht, ist der Innerdisk, das äh, das äh, schwarze Loch in äh, der Zentrum der Galaxie jetzt speichert. Äh, Supernova, das ist auf eine andere Galaxie. Supernova sind wichtig, weil natürlich die äh, schweren Elemente wie Eisen, äh, äh, Jod, Jod äh, Gold, die kommen nur aus Supernova. Wir können Sternen sehen und das ist eigentlich das Hauptgrund, wieso Sophia existiert. Und ich werde mich konzentrieren auf Sternen in der nächsten Folie oder Abdeckungen, zum Beispiel, wenn ein Objekt in der Sonnensystem vor einer Sterne vorbeigeht und dann, wie, wie der Sonnen- oder die Mond auch Abdeckung, dann wird das Licht runter, wenn das vor dem Objekt ist und dann wieder hoch. Und hier sieht denn Refraktion, also das heißt Pluto in diesem Fall, hat eine kleine Atmosphäre. Das haben sie entdeckt und das war Sophia. Also jetzt gehen wir in die Sternenstehung. Das jetzt ist Orion, jeder kennt Orion, das ist in Bonn sichtbar im Winter. Das ist wie äh, in optischer Bereich aussieht und das ist im Infrarotbereich. Hier kann man sehen diese kleine Nebel hier, das ist auch äh, sichtbar, das ist ungefähr 60 Prozent weniger hell als den Polarstern, aber in guten Nächte kann man auch von Bonn sehen. 
Und äh, ich konzentriere mich auf dieses Gebiet, das heißt M42. Und das ist ein externer Kindergarten. Da drin sind ungefähr 1000, so 700, zwischen 1000 neue Sterne, junge Sterne und fast 150 protoplanetarische äh, Scheiben. Das heißt, da werden so eine Systeme entstehen. Ähm, dieses kleine Objekt hier, das hier, ist ungefähr äh, 1500 Lichtjahre entfernt von der Erde und es ist äh, 24 Lichtjahre in Durchmessern im Vergleich zum Sonnensystem mit zwei. Ähm, Das sind die Fotos jetzt. Wir haben eine äh, Close-up von dieser äh, Nebula, also das hier. Jetzt werden wir nur dieses Gebiet sehen. Das ist das äh, sichtbare Licht mit, mit Hubble, Nahinfrarot von äh, äh, Chile, äh, European Space Observatory und SOFIA. Hier man sieht man drei Objekte, eigentlich, die interessant sind von uns, und zwar die Orion Gurtel, den Trapezsternhaufen und nur sichtbar in Fahrinfrarot den backling neugebaum region äh, Man sieht es unterschiedlich, äh, Licht in äh, unterschiedlich, wie, wie Sie sehen, auch unterschiedlich, abhängig von äh, welcher Frequenz man guckt. Sang, äh, fangen wir mit dem Trapezium-Sternhaufen. Man sieht hier vier Sterne. Das Rest ist da äh, unter den äh, Wolken und äh, Staub bedeckt, sieht man nicht. Schon in Nahinfrarot sieht man mehr, also es gibt mehrere Sterne. Und äh, in äh, Farinfrarot ist verschwunden. Das heißt, die Wärme in diesem Wellenbereich, dass die Zellen strahlen, ist weniger als den Staub. Ähm, und da, ähm, ja, die sind also ungefähr vier, vier Jahre Lichtjahre. Dann haben die Orion-Gurte hier, das ist gedacht zu sein, eine Stoßfront. Diese Sterne hier, den Trapezienstar, sind sehr jung. Sie strahlen Gas und dieses Gas wird dann in beide Richtungen, natürlich in die ganze Richtung, äh, verbreitet sich. Und hier ist eine Schockfront. Also das heißt, hier sieht man eigentlich im optischen Bereich nicht viel, nur einfach das Licht, das äh, von den Sternen kommt. Hier fängt an zu sehen ein bisschen Gas und hier sieht man tatsächlich, was die Moleküle da drin strahlen. Die sind äh, ähm, organische Moleküle. Und man denkt, dass in einigen, ich weiß es nicht wie vielen Jahren, werden auch da Sterne entstehen. Das dritte Region, diese BNKL-Region, ist überhaupt nicht sichtbar. Die ist völlig bedeckt bei den Wolken. Das heißt, wir werden das nicht wissen, dass da ist. Wenn wir gehen in, von der Erde, so von Chile, kann man ein bisschen orange Licht sehen. Das ist ein Staub. Und dann natürlich in Ferninfrarot mit Sophia ist ganz, ganz hell. Da drin sind auch äh, einige Sterne. Eine ist äh, eine Sterne, eine Protosterne, die, wird, die ist tausendmal heller als die Sonne. Ähm, ja, so ähm, wird auch da in der Zukunft werden wie den Trapezium. Also da werden sie auch Sterne sich entwickeln, wie genau jetzt ist. Jetzt die Frage ist, wieso wollen wir das wissen? Was können wir lernen? Und zwar, wie, wie stehen Sterne eigentlich? Und zwar, dass Gas und Staub, sie kollabieren zusammen durch Schwerkraft und auch durch ex externen Druck, zum Beispiel von dem Druck, dass diese Sterne mit dem Wind bläsen oder auch von Supernova. Das heißt, es wird kollabiert und werden sich Sterne formen. So weit, so gut. Haben wir alles verstanden? Nein. Haben wir nicht. Wenn wir die Theorie folgen, dann hätten wir, wir sollen sehen, mehr Sterne als eigentlich es gibt. Wir sind mehr, wesentlich weniger. Also es muss etwas anderes da sein, das wir noch nicht verstanden oder doch ein bisschen, aber unklar ist, wie das passiert. Deswegen mit Sophia müssen wir weiter in diesem Gewicht beobachten. Hier ist das gleiche Objekt, aber jetzt haben wir auch den magnetischen Feld dabei. Also wir haben Glück, dass, man, dass die, der Staub ähm, hat eine starke Emission in der in in Farinfrarot. Also, ähm, wie heißt das da? Ah. Ähm, die die Staub strahlt, strahlt polarisierte Richt in Farinfrarot und dann können wir das Magnet, Magnetfeld gucken. Und das hier, die gleiche Region, das ist die BNKL-Region. Und man sieht, wie das äh, magnetische Feld hier äh, diese Form hat. 
Das heißt, und hier ist zum Beispiel parallel. Was, was macht aber das magnetische Feld da? Hilft oder stoppt? Das wissen wir noch nicht klar. In diesem Fall hilft, aber eigentlich stoppt, aber wir wissen es nicht. Also wir müssen mehrere Objekte beobachten. Wir wissen es noch nicht genau, was da steckt. Also wir müssen eine statistische Sammlung von äh, Objekten gucken, um zu sehen, ob wir verstanden haben oder nicht. Dann jetzt mit der Sternenstehung Stopp. Wir machen jetzt den äh, Kern der Milchstraße. Das ist auch ein Licht von dem äh, Pressrelease, das ein, vor einigen Wochen passiert ist äh, mit den schwarzen Log-Fotos. Nächste Fotos wird von dieser Schwarzloch sein. Und äh, wir können sehen, <lacht> was jetzt äh, wir mit Sophia sehen können. Und zwar, wir sehen diesen Ring hier. Das ist bekannt. Das ist nicht nur bei Sophia beobachtet worden, ist auch im Radiobereich sichtbar. Aber diese Y hier, das ist eigentlich ein Gas, das den schwarze Loch futtert. Und das fällt in das schwarze Loch. Und das ist nur für Sophia. Ähm, wieso ist das wichtig? Weil das ist so nah, das können wir sehen. Aber die Galaxien sind eigentlich ähnlich. Also dann können wir extrapolieren, was passiert in anderen Galaxien, das äh, weit von hier entfernt sind. Ähm, jetzt habe ich... Äh, um, äh, zum Ende eine kleine Film für euch, um zu zeigen, wie das Leben an Bord des Sophia aussieht. Audio geht nicht. Audio. Audio. Ja, okay, dann. Ja, okay. Naja. Ist egal. Also das sieht man wie in Sophia drin. Jetzt ist das sich blockiert. Äh, nee. Wieso hat sich blockiert? Okay, das ist Sophia in den Hangar in, in Palmdale. So, sie fliegt aus Kalifornien. Das ist ein Spiegel, also wie das äh, aussieht. Das ist der Herr Hammers, das sitzt da, der ist Projektleiter bei Sophia in Bonn und der andere war der Projektleiter bei NASA. Jetzt sind die Fotos drin im Teleskop und es blockiert sich wieder. <lacht> und dann, die Leute bleiben da und das war's. <lacht> Tut mir leid. Ja, vielen, vielen Dank für diesen tollen Vortrag dem ich es auf die Bühne geschafft habe. Ähm, gibt es Fragen zu dem Vortrag? Ja. Richtig, also nicht das erste Molekül. Es ist eine von den ersten Molekülen, was gesehen wurde. Das war jetzt äh, vor die letzten zehn Tagen, glaube ich, dann ein Press-Release von Max Planck, also Jürgen Genuber. Ähm, die haben das in einem ähm, Sterngebiet gesehen. Also das war eine... Aber ja, das ist da äh, entdeckt worden. Helium de ja. Das wäre ein Puzzle gewesen. Keiner hat gesehen, wieso da nie, nie beobachtet wurde. Sollte da sein. Und jetzt haben sie das erste Mal gefunden, ja. Ja, da vorne. Der Flugplan für jede Mission steht ja im Detail fest. Es sind aber auch die Astronomen an Bord oft, die die Beobachtungen beantragt haben. Wie weit kann man noch eingreifen während der Mission? Was Nichts. machen die Astronomen eigentlich an Bord die ganze Sie Zeit? Sie gucken einfach ihre Daten und dann sa sagen, okay, ich habe genug äh, Signal zu Rausch bekommen, die Daten sind in Ordnung, aber den Flugplan ist, äh, kann man nicht ändern. Das Flugplan ist äh, bereits zehn Tage vorher mindestens oder sogar weniger, mehr. Und äh, das ist fest, also das sind zusammen auch den, äh, ähm, die anderen Flugzeuge. Also wir, können, wir haben nicht viel, viel, viel Raum. Und manchmal passiert das tatsächlich, dass also sie sagen, bitte ändere, Kurs ändern. Und dann haben wir, ja, so ist es. Noch mehr Fragen? Gut, dann habe ich noch zum Abschluss eine Frage. Es sind noch Fragen? Okay. <lacht> So, yes, so this, thank you very much to start Welcome. with. That was a very exciting talk, even though I don't understand German. Uh, but, uh, yeah. uh, so the question is, this looks like a very expensive experiment, right? So first, 
how much does it cost in general and to fly? And second, why do we need uh, an, uh, a telescope inside the plane? Can we do this from the ground? Um, soll ich auf Deutsch oder Englisch antworten? Uh, English. English, okay. This is a question that everybody is putting to us. <laughs> so the first, the easy answer why we have to fly is because of the troposphere. So we cannot do observation from ground. So the frequency that we cover, especially with the, the molecule that was now developed, one example, is uh, at gigahertz, so 1,2 to 1,6 gigahertz, I think, and it's not um, seen, you, c you can't see it from the ground, neither from the desert of the Atacama. The water vapor is content is too high. So you fly or you go outside the atmosphere with a satellite mission, and indeed there are some planned one. Um, Spica is an ESA mission, I should uh, sometimes fly. And the Americans and NASA are planning the Origin Space Telescope, but we are talking about missions that are going to deliver data late 2035-2040. Uh, so it's very long. In the meantime, you can think of balloon astronomy. You can go up with a balloon, but the um, receiver that you will be able to take on board are not as good as we have on board of Sofia, and the balloon flies only, for example, above Antarctica or North Canada for 80 days and then crash. So what we do is more, um, um, well, we do more object, we can do more things. And we are more flexible because Sofia is flying not only from the northern hemisphere, but also from the south. So for six to eight weeks a year, we are in uh, New Zealand and they fly from the south, or if there is an object, a target of opportunity that is seen only in the middle of the ocean, well, Sofia can fly there. That was the easy answer. The difficult one, the cost. Yes, Sofia is very expensive. Uh, we know that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at the moment, it's the, it's the only uh, observatory that we have that covers the frequency. So um, if we want to continue to study, uh, understand why ster, uh, uh, ster, uh, stars are formed, this is the only platform we have at the moment. The far infrared is only with Sophia. As soon as there will be a new mission, so we are talking in 20 year time, then she will be in any case too old to fly. It's already 40 year old, so it will become a vintage plane. I think there was everything, right? Yeah, then thank you very much. And we continue with our program. Thank you very much. And a big applause again for our speaker. Yes, what a great talk. I would love to go to Sofia one day. Let's, let's start from there. Right. So we have a lot of Astro swag to give you, a lot of different gifts and presents that you can get either by winning some of the raffles prices or we have a staff over the tables, it's free to take. And we have to thank our sponsors because you know we always want more sponsors. Uh, so you have a staff from the European Southern Observatory this time, from Euclid mission, space mission, and from the Astron, which is the Radio Institute for Astronomy in Netherlands. Thanks to Eleni who was there recently and now we got a staff from them. <laughs> Ja genau, wir haben auch heute wieder ganz viele tolle Preise für euch, äh, die ihr bei der Verlosung gewinnen könnt, die ihr mit uns im Instagram-Frame gewinnen könnt und auch äh, kostenlose Dinge, die wir auf den äh, Tischen auch verteilt haben. Dank an unsere Sponsoren, die Europäische Südsternwarte, ähm, die Euclid-Mission äh, sowie Astron, ein neuer Sponsor, das ist das äh, niederländische Radioastronomie-Institut, bei dem Eleni vor kurzem war und die wir als neue Sponsoren gewonnen haben. Also herzlichen Dank an die. Yeah. So apart from the sponsors that send us a lot of things, we also try to invest in doing different things like water bottles, mugs, uh, different things that we need for the event. And for that, we actually ask for your donations. And the way we do this is by asking a very cool question and you can answer and vote for your answer, for your favorite answer with your client spender. <laughs> which means that this time we're going to ask you which picture do you think was cooler? Which first picture, Pluto or the black hole? We had to ask, it was around the time. And we will have people going around with two pint glasses. We have Siat right there in the middle. And, and Eleni will go around. And every time you give a donation, then you get a raffle ticket. And then you can win very cool prizes. Genau, wenn ihr gerne an unserer Verlosung teilnehmen wollt, dann könnt ihr das machen, indem ihr an unserer tollen Abstimmung teilnehmt. 
Unsere heutige Abstimmung hat zum Thema erste Bilder oder Babybilder. Ähm, wir haben auf dem einen von unseren Biergläsern ein Bild, das erste Bild, das wir vom Pluto bekommen haben und auf dem anderen das erste Bild, das wir von einem schwarzen Loch bekommen haben. Und ihr könnt abstimmen, welches von den beiden Bildern besser aussieht. Also das Pluto-Bild hat sich entwickelt von diesem Bild zu diesem Bild und das schwarze Lochbild entwickelt sich vielleicht noch von diesem Bild in irgendwas. Aber dieses Bild ist schon ziemlich, ziemlich cool. Also wenn ihr das auch findet, dann stimmt bitte für dieses Glas ab. Ähm, Eleni und Siad werden mit äh, Birkgläsern herumgehen und ihr könnt mit einer kleinen Spende an unserer Verlosung teilnehmen und abstimmen, welches Bild denn besser ist. But we're not biased to any picture. But the black hole wir is wir very sind cool. überhaupt nicht voreingenommen, no. gar no. nicht. No, never. <lacht> So obviously we want to thank you for your donations, for being here. And if you don't have any money, don't worry. You still can participate and win prizes. And the way to do this is by taking pictures with our Insta frame or asking questions. Or you have Eleni giving you the raffle tickets right there. <laughs> Um, ja, wenn so ihr nicht an der Verlosung teilnehmen wollt, aber trotzdem Preise gewinnen wollt, dann könnt ihr auch ein Foto mit unserem Insta-Frame machen. Der ist gerade irgendwo im Raum, ja genau, da hinten ist gerade der Insta-Frame. Mit dem könnt ihr Fotos machen. Genau. Ihr könnt sie auf Instagram taggen oder ihr macht ein Foto mit einem von uns. Und dann könnt ihr auch tolle Preise gewinnen. Und die Gewinner vom letzten Mal sind hier auf den Bildern und wir würden sie gerne auf die Bühne bitten. So, if you identify yourself on the pictures, you won from the Insta frame last time. Eleni always wins, so she doesn't get a prize. It happens. <laughs> But uh, please come to the stage and collect the prizes. Yes, if you are here. Anyone? Yes, come, come. And anyone else? No? We have one. We have one person coming. <laughs> Big applause. So if you take pictures with the Insta frame, you can win awesome things like, what did we get? A poster. A poster of a nebula. <laughs> yeah, so it's a poster showing gas. Yes, the astronomers will explain it. <laughs> um, okay, so anyone else? Anyone recognizes else? themselves on these images. No one, no one. Well, you can take pictures with the Insta frame at the break, at the end of the event, tag us, take pictures with Eleni, she will tag you. She loves the social media. So now, now, what happened is, it's now, quiz time, quiz time, quiz time. And we come jetzt zum besten Part des Abends. Wir kommen zu unserem tollen Quiz, mit unserem tollen Quizmaster, unserer Quizmasterin, wenn man das so sagen kann. Genau. Sandra. So we have the only, the one, the worldwide famous acclaim all around, Sandra, Quizmaster, who is on her way to here. Let's Großer Applaus for für her. Sandra. Okay, hey everybody. Uh, sorry that there's no break, which is usually before the quiz because we are very short on time. I also had to cut two questions. Thanks, Miss Nebula. <laughs> Professional astronomer not even knowing the name of the nebula. <laughs> okay. So we're a bit short on time, as you've heard. That's why we start with the quiz right now. I hope everyone has a sheet in front of him or herself. Hat jeder von euch ein Quizblatt vor sich? Und wer nicht, soll jetzt mal bitte mit der Hand wedeln. Ich sehe niemanden, aber ich werde hier auch hart geblendet. So raise your hand if you don't have a quiz sheet. Okay. Um, dann habe ich noch eine Frage. Ist es okay für alle, die, die Deutsch sprechen, wenn ich das Quiz hauptsächlich in Englisch mache, um ein bisschen Zeit zu sparen? 
können dann vielleicht einige Väter das ein bisschen übersetzen für ihre Söhne? Und ähm, ja, äh, das Quiz ist zweisprachig, also das müsste helfen, aber es ist auch nicht viel draufgeschrieben. The quiz is bilingual, choose your favorite side, but choose one side, write your name or, or a pseudonym, pseudonym, I don't know. Because there's also a, a small survey in the, in the lower part. It's super anonymous since you have to indicate your name. <laughs> so, you know, just try to rip it or... Or, or you just don't care, or you use a pseudonym or something like this. It would be very nice of you if you could just fill that out for us, maybe also later, because we start the quiz now. Okay, it's only eight questions today. You see the questions on the screen, and then you can answer whatever you see, what makes the most sense belonging to the question. And then we collect it, and we rate it, and you can win prizes. So this is the question part, and the first category is Astro News. So I hope everyone has watched the news and especially is, has looked into Astro stuff. I will just ask a, a question now, and then uh, you, you choose whatever one of these four options seems best for you. And the first question is, who celebrated its 29th birthday at the 24th of April? which was quite recently, so you may have heard that. So was it this Sophia plane that we might have heard about today? Was it the Voyager? Was it the Hubble Space Telescope? Or was this this Sandra? Which is, if you don't like the quiz, a telescope, and if you like the quiz, it's me. <laughs> And then that brings us to the second question, if that's okay. What did astronomers measure around the, this black hole that you probably have seen? So was it some kind of light, some kind of sound? Was it this mysterious dark energy that we're searching for so long? Or the gravitational waves? It should be one of these four. You should only indicate one, otherwise it's invalid. <laughs> I guess you know that, Eduardo. <laughs> yeah. And this was for the pure knowledge of the part, and we, we continue to know your limits. So in this kind of new category, if you have been here before, it's uh, about limits, and you will see one limit, or I will explain one limit, that is, has astrophysical ground that exists, and that is a real thing, and then you, I, I will tell you about one limit, that it's total bullshit, because I made it up. But I try to be as, as scientific as possible with my explanation, and then you choose one of these two, which, what sounds more plausible to you. And the first, as you can see, indicated on your sheet, it's the Roche limit or the Fermi limit. And I explain both of them to you now, and then you can decide. So the Roche limit is the distance an object is held together by its own gravity. So you have, let's say, a planet approaching a very massive object, and then it, it, can, stay, it can stay intact as long as it has a certain distance, but as soon as it gets too close, it will be disrupted by the gravitational force. And there's this limit, and it's called the Roche limit, and you can see Mr. Roche on the right. Or is it, from the very or kind of famous scientist Enrico Fermi, is it the Fermi limit, which states that the number of extraterrestrial life can't be zero, since there are billions of stars, and every star has at least one planet, and if you just add up all these probabilities, life must exist besides Earth. And this famous limit was named after Fermi, the Fermi limit. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, decide now because we continue to the to the second choice of limits, which is the Olbers limit and the Addington limit, both famous physicists. Let's start with Olber, and I don't want to hear laughing. <laughs> this is this is Olber, and he he has. He made this statement back in the days that the universe must be finite. And the reason for this is, if it wouldn't be the case, we would see a star in every direction eventually, so the whole night sky should be illuminated. But we only see some of these stars, some of these galaxies, even with telescopes, it's not totally illuminated. So the universe must be finite. The famous Olbers limit. Or bullshit. Or is it the Eddington limit, which states that a certain astronomical object has a maximum luminosity, which is given by their gravitational force inwards, balanced by their radiation pressure outwards. So, you know, depending on the mass and size of this object, there must be some maximum luminosity which can't be exceeded. Then put the cross at the limit where you think that is real, please. <laughs> and then we would continue to our next category, which is also new and I I love to prepare that one, it was also my idea. It's about the uh, infamous Ig Nobel Prize. So um, I, I looked up some prizes, some, some all of them. <laughs> I had so much fun. <laughs> and, um, and, then, uh, and, and, and then I, I, um, I will now give you two prizes and uh, you just have to, to indicate whether you think these prices actually were given or whether it's so absurd that it only can come from my head. Yeah, so you gotta say, this, this Ig Nobel Prize was given, there was a scientific research about that or not. First one, the lethal penny drop. So, an Ig Nobel Prize has been given for ranking buildings according to their lethality when a penny is dropped from its roof as a function of weather and penny size. <laughs> I, I repeat that because the sentence is very convoluted. For ranking buildings according to their lethality when a penny is dropped from its roof as a function of weather and penny size, penny size, because there are different pennies in different states. So, did I make that up? Or has an Ig Nobel Prize reward been rewarded for that? And that brings us to the second wannabe Ig Nobel Prize, where you have to decide whether I made that up or whether it's actually happened. And it's about the very famous Mistkäfer or Dung Beetle. And it, it is about for discovering that when Dung Beetles get lost, they can navigate their way, ho their way home by looking at the Milky Way. I repeat for discovering that when dung beetles get lost, they can navigate their way home by looking at the Milky Way, like all of us go home, right? You know, we are lost, we look at the sky, then we fall down because we didn't look to the ground. <laughs> yeah, astronomical. Okay, okay, calm down. It's the last category, the last two answers, because we're short on time, it's only eight questions today, and I was told to hurry, so I just gotta 
speak faster that I can compress more information into that. And it is more or less. So you may know if you've been here before that I usually make guessing questions and it's kind of this guessing questions, but only now I give you a number. There are 10 people in this room and you have to indicate more or less. As example, don't indicate anything. Okay? Not that difficult. And start, so the first one is 53% of the moon's surface is illuminated as seen from Earth. So when you are stand on Earth, you can only see 50% of the moon's surface because everything else is always pointed away from us. Could be more, could be less. <laughs> I assure you, it's not 53%. <laughs> And then, please decide. And then we wiggle to the last question today. And by the way, you have to wait for the second talk, which will be in English and will have, it's more a performance than a talk, you'll see. And then there will be another astro slam telling you about what is this black hole image and whether you saw some light, sound, dark energy or uh, the other thing I invented. And, and after that, you'll get the solutions and also the prizes if you want. Because we'll count now and then uh, you can win some prizes. And that brings me to the last question, so my, my last part for now, which is, a solar prominence can be as big as the Earth. I don't expect every one of you to know what that is. That's why I gave you a picture. This is a solar prominence. It's a kind of gaseous filament that extends from the photosphere of the sun, and we can see it usually on the edge, otherwise it's called differently. And this thing can get quite big, but how big? And I claim it's as big as the Earth, and you have to decide whether it's more or less. And now you got time to ponder about all these questions until we collect your sheet. If you don't collect it, you can't win. And with that, uh, you, you, you have earned your small break until we hear the great talk, where the flux are we, when we call you back. So thank you very much.
Bir saniye. Hallo? Ah. Ja, es geht gleich weiter in unserem Programm. Ich hoffe, ihr hattet alle eine schöne Pause. Konntet alle neues Bier bestellen. Ja, unser zweiter Vortrag heute ist von Kevin Harrington. Kevin ist äh, ein Doktorand am Agelander-Institut. Und ähm, er hat zwei Bachelor-Titel tatsächlich. Und zwar sowohl in Astronomie als auch in Neurowissenschaften von der Universität Massachusetts Amherst in den USA. Und in seiner Doktorarbeit ähm, beschäftigt er sich mit Sternentstehung in weit entfernten Starburst-Galaxien. Und sein Vortrag heute heißt Where the Flux are we? Und es geht um Beobachtungen und wie sie uns dabei helfen, das Universum besser zu verstehen. So our second talk today is in English and is by Kevin Harrington. He is studying at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He actually studied astronomy and neuroscience, and now he's doing his PhD at the Argelander Institute for Astronomy, so University of Bonn. And he works uh, looking at galaxies that produces a lot of stars, and he's gonna tell us a little bit about that and about uh, where the flux are we. And as a plus, Kevin actually plays the drums, and today he will play the drums for us as well. So let's give him an applause. <laughs> So, where the flux are we? So, there's a direct answer to this. Uh, we're here in Fiddlers, so we can cheer to that. But another direct answer to where the flux are we? Where are we? Well, as far as we know, we are about 25,000, a little bit more than 25,000 light years from the center of our galaxy. So, from the time that the dinosaurs were around, we were at the other side of the galaxy. We had already gone around the Milky Way. So that's where we are. I really just want to share some, some thoughts from a lot of observations that I've done in the process of observing and things that I really love about observing and some insights that I wanted to share with you. So uh, rather than it being uh, a style of a, of a talk, like presentation, I really just want you to think you're at a pub and I'm just sitting down next to you You know, we just happen to say, you know, where are we? It's one of those simple questions. Uh, so just to explain what I mean by flux. As astronomers, we're always talking about flux. If we're radio astronomers, we're talking about Janskys. And to visualize flux, you can see this flow throughout the Amazon rainforest, above in the clouds. It's really amazing. And Flux is really the density of flow, the power per surface area. So if there's any takeaway, you know, that's one, what flux really is. So you can measure it in watts per square meter. And as I said, radio astronomers talk about Janskys, which is 10 to the minus 26 on that order of watts per square meter. <coughs> so talking about flow, we're embedded within this flow, the Hubble flow. At this point, in the, universe is the universe is expanding and it's accelerating its expansion. And to get to this point, there was a huge distribution of matter that through gravity, everything sort of came together. And there's always this flow that we can think about. And when you think of astronomers, you can think of two categories. You can think of astronomers who are more uh, theoreticians who play God and they use supercomputers and they you know, extrapolate from initial conditions based on the laws of physics to where we are. Uh, there are also observational astronomers who deal with observational data. And then there's a small sliver of observational astronomers that I find myself fortunate enough to say that I'm a part of who, who live the romantic life of actually going and getting the data hands on. And in that process, You can think of it as just part of the job. But for me, I really try to be more philosophical about it. And so one of the things that I really appreciate about observing is that if I'm pointing the telescope to a point in the sky that somebody maybe have nev has never looked at before, I can think about where we are at this moment in terms of this overall flow that we're just a part of, which is really quite incredible. So just that concept itself, that we're always a part of something that's ever expanding. So here are a couple telescopes. 
that I've had uh, the opportunity to work at. A couple weeks ago, I was in Granada at the 30 meter telescope. And it's a couple thousand meters up. And you might have heard from the previous talk where there's uh, the astronaut testing and they have to go through all these out high altitude conditions and everything. I can definitely say there's uh, less oxygen when you get higher up. And things definitely age faster. In fact, you can take a cesium atom, which is a, a really precise clock, and you can time two clocks, two cesium atom clocks together, take one up a couple thousand meters, and when it comes back down, it's going to be a nanosecond faster. So maybe that's why I've grown so much hair, because I, you know, a couple weeks ago, I, I was bald. And I, I just got back from Granada. I was up there for just two weeks. So we know where we are by observing. And that's, that's a really profound thing in terms of uh, where we've come in terms of humanity. So we have gone far beyond just locating reference frames and landmarks and saying, oh, yeah, that, that's over there. We're right here. You know, maybe if we travel there for a couple days and we still see that, that's going to still be there. We can sort of figure out where we are. So the whole process of observing, I think we've often taken for granted the real miracle and just really understanding where we are and going far beyond just looking at landmarks on the Earth. One thing that I like to think, uh, think about when I'm observing is that there's always a physical, physical scale to be considered. Uh, you can see how California and the US and Italy are roughly uh, a, a half of Pluto, they could stretch over the diameter of Pluto. That gives you an impression of some scale. Um, the distances between things are just really profound. Like I said, it's 25,000 light years. It takes light a whole year at a foot, uh, foot per nanosecond, which is a third of a meter per nanosecond. So 25,000 light years just to get to the center of our galaxy from where we are. You can think of neutrinos, 10 to the minus 24 meters. There's 100 trillion neutrinos that pass through our bodies every second, just from what's output from the sun. These are light mass, uh, lightly interacting uh, particles that just go right through us every second, 100 trillion. These things often just go unnoticed. And then you can p pick someone's hair next to you and just take a look, and that's about the smallest you can see. Maybe uh, you have some trouble over there. The interesting thing also is that as astronomers, we're always looking back in time. I always find that fascinating. And it gives us an impression of, of time itself. But because of special relativity, general relativity, we understand that time is really not as fixed as we think it is. As I mentioned, when we, you take a clock up to the, a few thousand meters and bring it back down, it's actually faster because it had less of a gravitational pull from the center of the Earth. We define time from the start of the Big Bang. Uh, what was before that, I can't comment. Nobody can really comment. We can't really see even 300,000 years after the Big Bang. But the thing is that space-time exists in a four-dimensional realm so for all we know, the future could be to our left or to our right. And our future always exists because of this four-dimensional space-time. And so the real important thing is that it's the intervals between things, the cause and effect, that really change what's happening and allow us to measure what's happening. And when we look back in time, we look at, we look at things with respect to where they were prior at a different event in space-time. So it's just something to think about. It's, it's rather abstract. I don't think many astronomers actually think about the fact that we're embedded within this space-time all the time. We're just crunching numbers on our computers. So just to try to bring home the concept of what it's like to actually observe, uh, for me, I have a lot of experience observing more at uh, radio frequencies. But on the far left, you see in this particular image, uh, ultraviolet frequencies, visible frequencies where our eyes see, and you see whether or not you can see through the atmosphere at those frequencies. So at, at some frequencies, it's just a complete wall. You can't see anything. 
But as you go to specific pockets in our atmosphere, from the ground, you can see through the atmosphere into the Milky Way or into the extra galactic space. And as was mentioned, Sophia, because it's so high, it allows you to see above some of these walls in the atmosphere. If you go to very low frequencies, you get to the radio frequencies, which are interesting because there's just a clear window into the, the whole universe, basically. If you go to very, very low frequencies, hundreds of megahertz, that's where our TV stations have communication channels. Uh, our cell phones are detecting one to three gigahertz, roughly. So a hertz, of course, is a, a cycle per second. So in measured in terms of the electromagnetic radiation, that's the, what we're measuring. So if it's a gigahertz, that's the particular frequency. It's just like a radio station has a specific frequency. So you can see in the US, there's an allocation for radio frequencies. And a small sliver of that is for radio astronomy. The rest is for naval communications and GPS satellite communications and everything like that because the atmosphere is so clear to radio waves, radio light waves. If you go to very, very low frequencies, you can get to hundreds of hertz, which is on the order of where instruments have their range and in, in what they output. So you can go from the bassoon to the vocal uh, soprano, uh, the alto sax, the alto vocal, these are hundreds of times per second. But the difference here, of course, in the analogy, is that these are not sound waves. These are, I mean, these are not light waves. These are sound waves. So they are slightly different. The wavelength is, you can measure it as the same. But how you determine the wave, sound is through the compression. And light is an electric field and a magnetic field. So my, my final thought that I would like to share with you today is a connection that I thought of recently uh, as I was observing. I was done observing. I went to Amsterdam, and there was a recording studio that I am doing some work at. And it just dawned on me how many similarities there are. And the fact is that when I'm observing, now I don't know whether or not I'm recording music or I'm observing and recording data from some extra galactic signal. Because let me just try to paint a picture. So at the control room, at a radio telescope, you're at a control room. You're the observer. You're going to point the telescope. What you need to do is you need to tell the telescope operator that you know, I want to use this instrument for the telescope, and I want this instrument to be at this specific frequency of light so that I can measure whatever I want to measure and do the science. And the telescope operator goes and changes the hardware. And in the same way, when you go to a recording studio, you're getting there. There's the person that goes and sets up the microphones. Marcel is this person right now, the sound engineer. You know, you have the the person who does all the hardware setup, the one who gets everything situated, makes sure that the musicians are in place, and then you proceed. And when you're recording data from the telescope, the light bounces off the dish, hits the focal point, gets received by the detectors, and then from there, a fiber optic cable usually passes that information to the computer. And because we live in a di digital age, you know, that's sampled at certain chunks. So we take in information at so many chunks. And it's the same process when you're recording music. You know, you have a microphone, you have a recording software, and you're sampling the music in certain chunks. When you are recording, sometimes you have to take multiple takes. You know, you're not always going to lay down that certain lick or play a certain way each time. So you, you want to take multiple takes, have a lot to work with. You can cut pieces. And uh, a similar approach is actually taken in astronomy because I'm trying to, for instance, observe a signal that has the power of a snowflake hitting the ground. And in order to really get that signal to come across above the whole atmosphere, 
I need to look at that point in the sky for a very long time, take multiple takes of integrating on that target to receive more and more light. In the, the final stages, uh, after the musicians have recorded their album, let's say, there's a process of mixing. And so you have to change the levels. Uh, you can raise the volume or raise the bass in one instrument, raise the treble in some other instrument, and you mix it all together. And in the same way, when you're processing radio data, often you're just adding up all of the different times that you took information, and you're averaging it together, and you're making it look equal to some extent. I can go into more details. I'd rather not. So that's my final slide, actually. And I really just wanted to leave you with this impression of you know, just thinking about simple questions like, where are we in a different manner? So what are we? Who are we? And so on. And so one of the ways that I like to observe daily life is to play the drum. And so I'll just play the drum for a couple minutes. Sometimes I play the drum while I'm observing, because you can set the telescope to point at a certain point of the sky. And then it goes for an hour. So you got to do something, right? So sometimes I'll drum. So I, I, without further ado, I just want to play for a couple minutes. And then afterwards, Eduardo will share with us some news about the black hole discovery. So thank you very much for your attention. Hello. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Kevin, for talk and for a great performance. So let's clap one more time for him. I got excited. I forgot about questions. 
<laughs> yes. So now it's questions time. Questions. You can also ask about the drums. It's okay. <laughs> Anyone? There. Yeah, so the question is, uh, if I understand correctly, when you get to a studio, there's a certain reputation from the sound engineer, that's for sure. When you get to a telescope, the telescope operator can be kind of cool, personality-wise, but at the end of the day, the output is the same, like they, they stick to a book, sort of. Um, but I, I'm definitely friends with some operators more than others, just because we get along. Other question? Alessandra? Yeah, so the comment was a uh, Norwegian professor came to the Max, for music, uh, came to the Max Planck Institute and actually did some music related to the VLBI, which is interconnecting all the telescopes across the world. And you can find that on YouTube. Questions? Question. You always have a question. I am curious. Curious mind. Mr. Mrs. Curious Mind. Mrs. Curious Mind. Okay, Dr. Curious Mind. Uh, okay, so Kevin, astrophysics or neuroscience? Or drums? <laughs> drums. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have two more questions there. So back and front. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on the relativistic side of things, but that is, the, that is another um, test you can do for general relativity is take a clock out and travel around the globe. One might be with the speed, and, and one is with actually being a, a distance that's, you have a uh, measurable difference in the gravitational potential. Uh, yeah. And we had one more question there. Yeah. Kevin? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. So, like, what basically, what is my favorite telescope uh, that I've used and what I might want to use in the future? I, I'm always fascinated when I'm using the Green Bank Telescope uh, because it's 100 meters in diameter. And when you're pointing that thing, it's just magnificent just to put the code, put the code together, hit, hit start, and then you see this huge, monstrous thing just move. And nowadays... With uh, a lot of things are going into the direction of uh, putting telescopes together into a network called interfer an interferometric approach. Uh, and with that, you don't have that sort of, you don't always have that sort of personal, intimate relationship with the observing. So maybe, I don't know. <laughs> That's my own personal bias. So, but it would be cool to really operate one of those an antennas of like a, a network of the interferometers and see all of them move once you press something. Great, so this is the end for the second talk. Let's give one last round of applause to Kevin. <laughs> and now we have a very special guest. He actually gave us a talk before he at AOT. Uh, he is Professor Dr. Eduardo Ross. He is a professor at the University of Valencia and he works at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. And 
he actually did something super cool, which is being part of the team that took the picture of the black hole. So he's going to tell us about it today. Yeah. Ganz großer Applaus für Professor Eduardo Ross, der heute hier ist als Überraschungsgast. Er ist Teil der Kollaboration, die das erste Foto eines schwarzen Loches aufgenommen hat und auch am MPI hier arbeitet er. Und deswegen kann er uns ganz viel darüber erzählen. Also großer Applaus für Professor Eduardo Ross. Did you take the remote control with you? Kevin. Ah, is there, is there. <laughs> Who hasn't seen this picture before? This. <laughs> Maybe you have seen that, uh, have seen that on, the, on the bottom part of, the, of your wallet or on the hand of Homer Simpson, <laughs> or uh, replacing the heads of many people in Facebook, or in many other places. I mean, that shows you that this picture that we kept in our computer during several months, like my precious ring, <laughs> was, uh, has become iconic and has become also even part of the popular culture. But actually, this is the first picture, as Shep and other colleagues said, this is the first picture ever of a black hole. You can argue that this is not maybe the first picture of a black hole, but we see there something in the middle, which is a gap. And in this gap, something like that is the black hole in the heart of the galaxy Messier 87, which is a big object in the constellation of Virgo. As I explained two months ago, we have been working hard over years to get to put a lot of telescopes together in the most remote places, at uh, dry and high places, and we have had people like Alan Roy, who is here, fighting at 5,000 meter height with the elements, even with the lack of oxygen, you cannot think so well there, uh, just to make everything work, recording this, which are shipped to bone, are correlated post-process and all that, and at the end, they say, uh, after years of work, you get that. Some people say, ah, oh, boring, it's not sharp enough, and so on. <laughs> Look, this is like looking to a billiard ball or to a, to a tennis ball put here from the moon. Imagine that you have now to, to play tennis with this uh, tennis ball and say, yeah, <laughs> go, and I, I return it to you. This picture is showing us several things. We have. This picture, which is a kind of a surprise in the, in the center of M87, people were expecting for a picture in the center of the galactic center. The galactic center is variable, it's like a toddler moving around, and doesn't behave properly, changes every 10, 15 minutes, so that this is still to take a picture. We are trying to make a movie. We will manage, I hope, in the next months or years, but first we went into this one, which is M87, and we will show you that in another rendition in uh, two ways. One is where it is and where does it belong. And the other thing is what are we looking actually? Because you say, well, yeah, it's a ring. There's a black hole here. Actually, if we put this in context, there is also a jet here which goes away from here and goes through the sailing and goes through the clouds quite far away at scales which are many, many thousands of times this is scale of the black hole. This black hole is feeding a disk and doing things, pumping energy also into magnetic fields which create this jet. And what we see just zooming really into that is just this ring which is showing us the, the elements, the things that are behind that. But bef before talking on that, I will show that with two movies. The first one is a zoom. People say, ah, boring, another zoom. Well, we do a zoom because we are looking something in extreme detail uh, which was never reached before, or only was reached with the space, the LVI, which is putting a radio telescope in space, letting it go in around the Earth, and this is comparable to that. This is really amazing what we managed to do, and several of the people who have worked in this image, actually, one of these guys who was typing and looking the picture in the computer and say, wow, Eureka, and went out to the corridor, is this guy, uh, Jae Young, <laughs> who was doing that there. 
I also had something in my computer, but uh, they did much, much more stuff. And actually what we see is that if you look to the uh, sky over the Atacama Desert, for example, here you see uh, the antennas of ALMA and also the antenna of Apex, which is not far away from that. And if you look into the constellation of Virgo, which is uh, up there in, in the winter nights, and you zoom in, the first thing that you will see by zooming that really many, many orders of magnitude is a radio galaxy which has two uh, huge lobes um, uh, or a huge um, emission in, a, in an area which has been observed over the many decades already with the VLA and other instruments. You see that there. This is this object. And when you get zooming into that, you will see pictures that we have been taking over the last 20 years in our institute and other places. There you see Hubble Space Telescope image. There you see some pictures by Yuri Kovalev taken at this institute. You see the picture of the PhD of Ye Yong there. And if we look farther there, we see the black hole. We have made a, th a zoom of 10 to the 9, I mean, of 9 orders of magnitudes. This is many octaves in a piano, if you think. And at the end, we go to, to this picture. And you can ask yourself, what are we looking? We have tried to make, a, to make a movie with the theory team and the simulations team to explain you what we see. Because the interesting thing that, yeah, is that no matter from which side you see a black hole or a disc or whatever, you see a ring. And this is because the black hole is swallowing the light that comes from, from behind. And at the end, you get just a silhouette. And I show you just now what I mean with that. This is. M87 in an artistic rendition, a simulation or numerical thing. There in the center of the galaxy, you see a, an accretion disk rotating. There's a black hole in the center and two jets which are ejected to, in perpendicular to that. If you look farther zooming into that, you see that the black hole and the photons go around. Some of them have two curved trajectories. And now imagine that you are here at this side. All the photons who come, which come from different directions, get deflected. And at the end, if you look from your point of view in your screen, what you see is that a figure like that, somehow like that. If you compare that with your simulations, you have a kind of matter which is there, which corresponds to all these photons. And this is what you see with your telescope, which is not as perfect as a simulation, but it's real. We are looking really to the photons who come from this area or from behind. I can run it again, just for the fun. Um, not this one. No, not the zoom again. This one, again. You see the, the black hole, which is several billion of solar massive, at 22 million um, of light years from us. It's 1,000 times farther away than the black hole at the center of our galaxy. You look into the heart of that, and now I just Show again, imagine all the photons, all the light going around, and independently from your point of view, you see a ring. And this ring is formed in this way, as it is shown here, just that you can understand. The ring is bigger than the event horizon. The event horizon is a bit smaller, as you see here, it's a, around a factor of five. But this is the first time we have managed to see what was in the simulations, what was in the movie of Interstellar. We have put that with another color because some people claim this is the gates of hell, the end of space and time and all that. You can put all the nice words there. But actually, this is amazing. Now you have that in t-shirts and in mugs and in the internet. But I think we can be also quite proud that in this, in our institute, 30 people were working on that. We managed, being amateurs, to keep the secret until the end. And then everybody has reported about that, which is also quite uh, amazing that we managed. I still cannot believe that. And also, it's a pleasure to report that today. And here are several individuals who have contributed to that. They have also worked hard for years to get it done. And more is coming. The movie is coming, maybe uh, polarization images and other stuff, because we, we have more data, and we have more ideas, and better instruments now. OK? Thank you very much. You're very good with time. Um, so thank you for an amazing talk. It 
really is an exciting result. And now we have some time for questions. Any questions? Nothing here? I cannot see. So I have a Yeah, that's a, I would say a very good question. Indeed, it is. The thing is that the ring, uh, the question is why do you see some part of the ring which is brighter than the other? The thing is that we know that in this black hole things are rotating clockwise, okay? And the things which approach to us look bluer and brighter, and the things that go away from us look uh, dimmer or less bright, I'm red. This is the so-called Doppler effect. We are looking in a, into a ring. The part which is coming to us from the matter falling into the black hole is brighter in the south, in the bottom part, and the upper part is of things that are rotating in the other direction and going away from us. This is why we see an asymmetry. This is a relativistic effect, effect which is not corrected in interstellar. <laughs> Keep Thorne, put that into the movie, and they say, ah, but people with Gilded, then you get only a crescent moon, uh, remove that. <laughs> Other questions? Questions? One, and then a Anika? second. Uh, 25 micro arc seconds. But three? The relation of this picture, um, the, it's a very high definition picture. The size of the ring is 42 micro arc seconds, the width. And the beam? Uh, micro arc seconds. The beam is around 25, but we used three methods. We got 50,000 images. I mean, Dion was having a hard time. With different methods, some of them do not have this beam. This is using this a thing called maximum entropy method or regularization, which assumes some function of the source, but doesn't have really a, mean, uh, a beam. Your resolution is you have just to divide the size of the Earth, uh, I mean, the wavelength by the size of the Earth. And then you come to around that 20, 20 micro arc seconds, 25. Okay. Great. And then we had a second question right there. My question is nowhere near as good. <laughs> yeah, the best one. Because, like, you know, Fox was taking this photo and mapping the result of this photo, and this was a new information that you guys got, or did you learn something new about, like, the black hole part of the black hole? Like, what's the middle? Did you learn something? Well, the question is if, if we learn something new. Uh, if, uh, from the black hole. Yes, we did. First of all, uh, one of the things is that there are alternative theories to black holes, to mimickers, to things that can camouflage like a black hole, etc. Some of them are now discarded. The, some, uh, some of these uh, things. Still, some of them can work. Grava stars, boson stars, whatever. This is one of the things we learned. The second one is that we have tested the, the, the deflection of light at the extreme regime confirming and not uh, falsifying, again, Einstein's theory, which is nice. The general relativity still works. <laughs> ah, that's a pity for the theoreticians, but that's the case. And the other thing is that just from this um, picture that you see there, I, I show that, um, we can learn a lot of things. If we measure the size, we can uh, measure the mass of the black hole and compare it with previous predictions. We can know that this black hole is rotating, it's not stable. We can uh, now discard that this is other things. Um, pr most probably it's a black hole. And we also see extended emission. And in the next time, we expect also to understand how is the role of the magnetic fields and why do we have jets? Because jets are in most of these galaxies, which is a mystery still of how is that working. There are several models. Yeah, there's uh, this, um, this stream coming out that was discovered actually 100 years ago by photographic plates, and they said, ah, there's something funny there. We don't know. Now we know what it is. Um, all that can be learned from that. And we have also developed several techniques of imaging, and we have been working hard for this technique, which is also used in many other areas of life. You have just to think that uh, GPS is one of the, of the um, descendants of this technique. Um, and other things that we are doing now in radio astronomy, like Wi-Fi, also comes from radio astronomers. I mean, we keep working hard to enhance things that, not from this picture, but from the technique, we get also a lot at a given time. We cannot tell now what, but I am sure that something will come over the next years from all this effort. Well, that, wow, that's it questions. for today with questions. Maybe.
I'm going to, nope, yep, that's yeah. it for today with questions, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> really tight schedule today. But you can always ask him at the end I'm of the sitting event. Here. Yes, he's sitting right there. Um, so, <laughs> and uh, let's thank him one more time. Thanks to you. So now it's the time that you all been waiting for, apart from the black hole explanation, which is very, very cool. And now we're going to tell you the answers to the quiz and the winners of all the stuff that you have collected, ruffle tickets, questions, all those things, Insta frames, things. I'm back. <laughs> the super anticlimactic uh, solutions to the quiz, wherever I find the presenter. Another video, another video, another video, <laughs> click, another video, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's mine, I do lensing, I don't do this uh, radio waves, and the quiz solutions, so I hope you all have in mind what the questions were, and anyways, I repeat them, but as we have mentioned 3,000 times today, we are tight on schedule, so um, yeah, I, I just go through that. So first category was the Astro News, and I saw that several people actually thought that I really would put my birthday <laughs> in this survey. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to make sure here I did not. So on the, 29, uh, on the 24th of April, our uh, very much loved Hubble Space Telescope got 29. And uh, yes, so you can compare your age now to this space telescope still making the most impressive pictures that I, that, uh, it, besides from black holes that, uh, that we can view these days. And the second question was, what does, did astronomers measure around the black hole? I don't need to explain anything about that. It was explained just now. It's actually light. Dark energy would be cool, but that comes later. Next Nobel Prize then. The second category was know your limits. And um, one limit I made up. One limit was real. And so the first one was this Roche limit. There's this distance where objects are held together by their own gravity or they're, they're disrupted if they get too close. The other one was the Fermi limit, that there must be aliens out there. That's like the, the three things that astronomers, astronomers always get asked. What about these aliens? Uh, and the black holes, the wormholes especially, and these multiple universes. <laughs> so this one is about the aliens. I made that up. <laughs> um, there's a Fermi paradox which states that we should expect some, some signal, some extraterrestrial signal from this uh, intelligent life, but we don't. So it's a paradox. There's no limit. He didn't state that it must be that there is anything uh, out there. So actually, there is this Roche limit uh, telling you if I get too close to a very massive object, I, I, I might explode or something. This is totally related to astronomy here, and I don't want you to interpret that. The second one is the Olbers limit and the Eddington limit, and I also made one up out of those. So one was this Olbers limit, the universe must be finite. That is bullshit. <laughs> It does not, it's just that whatever we can observe must be finite because light takes some time to, to come to us. And if the universe hasn't existed since forever, then of course what we can see cannot be infinite. But this has nothing to do with what this guy proposed. He just stated, you know, if the universe would be static like we thought back in the days, then this effect should happen. What actually exists is the Eddington limit. It tells you that gravity pushes everything inwards and then you can have some light pressure that's going outwards, but if you have more pressure from the inside, then it's, it's holding this thing together, then of course it will just explode. So this is the Eddington limit, it's very famous, and it's also used to, to explain why black holes can be so bright. 
And that brings us to the third category, the Ig Nobel Prize. You might see this category again because it's, there are so many other funny prizes. <laughs> they even give it to, to majors from cities that, that run tanks over luxury cars because they're illegally parked. But, but <laughs> you, you can have a look if you want to have, have some fun. The Liesl Penny Drop is an urban legend and no scientist ever made a list out of that. Because you can drop a penny from the highest, uh, highest building in the world and it won't kill a person. So you cannot rank buildings according to their lethality because it's not lethal. But it's an urban legend and I hope uh, I, I could confuse some people. The, the second was then the dung beetle. And usually if, if one is false and the other one is true, yes, actually, there was the paper, Dung Beetles Used the Milky Way for Orientation by Ducker et al. in 2013. <laughs> and it got the joint prize for biology and astronomy. Yeah, you, you have to achieve that in your life. So this is true. They actually also use stars, not only the Milky Way itself, they're also fine with some stars. So they, they, they are kind of smart. Smarter than I expected them to be. And then we got um, the more or less, where the first one was 53% of the moon's surface is illuminated. You know, as the moon ero evolves around the Earth, we see, we see a bit of the surface of the moon. And then you might have heard that we only see one side of the moon. But that's not totally true, because we see <laughs> about 60%. And this is actually an image from the, from the back side of the moon that we can't see, which has uh, like all these little, um, little meteorite things. Crater. <laughs> Crates? Crater? I don't know. And then the very last one is a solar prominence can be as big as the Earth. And if you've been here, I think the first time, People were shouting at me because I, 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 I made the questions up to a factor of two. This time, it's, it's more than 10 times as big as, as, a, as the Earth is, is big. So these things get really, really huge, uh, caused by the magnetic field. Uh, really interesting stuff. Maybe we have a talk about that in the future. And that is everything I wanted to, to tell you today about the quiz. And I, I hope you're always looking forward to to the next quiz and to the next talk. And now, the, the most important thing, I think, you all been waiting for, the winners. Since not all of the Instagram winners showed up, uh, there's one more prize for the quiz, which is good for you. And I will now pronounce the name of the winners, and please don't force me to pronounce the last name. <coughs> First one is Verena. Ah. I don't know. They're all and she wins. Auntie, what does she win? It's a book from Stephen Hawking, and it's called <laughs> Kurze Antworten auf große Fragen. Do you speak German? Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so the second winner is Ike. E-I-K. Ike. Ah, yeah. Maybe they all talk to each other and they all won. <laughs> let's see, let's see. And I get the cup from the Agelander Institute. <laughs> and the third winner is Ellen. <laughs> ah, good, good. <laughs> ah, yeah. And Ellen gets a Kölsch glass from Euclid, where you can... You want to exchange that? Okay. 
where you can measure redshifts and distances and magnitudes with beer. Awesome. And then the, the last non-astronomer winner is, uh, I, I hope it's a pseudonym, it's hamster. Ah, yeah, there's the hamster. And the hamster gets a, 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 a ruler from Euclid, I guess. And then, and then we have the last winner, which is, I hope that 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 looks super Spanish, Papa Sote. Papa Sote, astronomer. Woo! This this is Eric, and Eric has three no two members of AOT in his office, and we are always there to discuss stuff. He hates us, but he still comes every month. <laughs> and what he will he win? An Eiffel mug. AOT mug, you get an AOT mug since you love us so much. Yep, and that's it from me to you, and I hope to see you next month in uh, May. Yeah, the last Tuesday of May, and then please keep si si keep sitting. My God, my voice. And then, because there are more prizes to win from the raffle, but this is not what I will do. This is what the, the, the beautiful moderators of this event will do for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ja, danke Sandra. Jetzt geht's an die Preise von unserer Verlosung. Yes, so thank you Sandra and we keep giving prizes right now. <laughs> yes, this is prize time. Uh, we actually have a prize master, the same as a quiz master, but today her secretary is helping us. And we are going to tell you first that thank you for your donations. Uh, the actual picture that won is the one from Pluto. How sad is that? So apparently the first picture of Pluto is cooler than the first picture of the black hole. I disagree, but... The people has spoken. Ja, vielen, vielen Dank für eure lieben Spenden. Gewonnen hat tatsächlich das Bild von Pluto und nicht das erste Bild eines schwarzen Loches, obwohl wir ein bisschen voreingenommen waren. Aber vielen, vielen herzlichen Dank. Also Pluto ist der Gewinner. Ja. Yeah. So we are going to give you the raffle ticket prices now. Um. Secretary Price, okay. Master slash Helper. Also, der erste Verlosungspreis geht an die Nummer 14. 14. 40. 40. You did read that. 14, sorry. You don't know the numbers. Großer Applaus für unseren ersten Gewinner. So, what does he get? Ah, Stephen Hawking book in English. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's so, take a picture first. Yes. Machen wir erstmal ein Foto. Genau. We are actually going to collect the prize winners at the end of the event. All of you from all different prizes, you know, different games. And so we can take a picture, hopefully. So please come to the stage at the end of the event if you want something. Der nächste Gewinner ist die Nummer 1. Number 1. Großer Applaus nochmal. And he wins, he actually gives a prize, or she, sorry, she. I just saw a he walking, no. Um, this is a sponsored by Fiddlers and it's a good shine for the Kino. So, yes. Genau, Enjoy. ein Kino-Gutschein, gesponsert von Fiddlers. Their prize. Is for Nummer 8. 8. I believe you. <laughs> Nummer 8. The right side of the stage these days is winning a lot of things. Things happen. 
Uh, it's the lucky hand of Eleni, yes. Uh, so, <laughs> it's the last challenge genau. to get here. Du okay, das, das Geschenk ist ein, eine ganz tolle AOT-Flasche, die noch in der Packung ist, wenn du sie rausnehmen möchtest. Eine schöne Aluminium-Wasserflasche oh. mit unserem Logo. <lacht> Nummer 24. 24. Noch ein Kölschglas von Euclid. Begeisterte Biertrinker, hoffe ich. <lacht> And the last prize, last or two last, second to last, last, last prize winner of the day. Is Nummer 39. 39. I'm getting better with these numbers. <laughs> you see, asking questions pays off. Or donating money. And the price is a notebook from Euclid. Very cool notebook. Oh, we have one more prize. Vier und, uh, 43. 43. We have sogar doppelte Gewinner heutzutage. And we get a bag. That's the last one more. Ellen is very generous today, so apparently we get one more. Give everything away. <laughs> Die Nummer 9 für unseren letzten Preis. Nummer 9. 9. 9. 9. 9. 9 to the 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see them moving. Nummer What do they get? What does oh, yeah, she get? Over there. Does he get? Okay. Yes. And you get a beautiful poster of the moon. Sandra, I know that name. The moon. Großer Applaus nochmal für alle unsere Verlosungsgewinner. Okay, noch ein letzter Preis für die Nummer 45. 45. 45. 45 is there. Heute kriegt jeder einen Preis bei uns. So, just remember, if you want a prize, just please stay for five minutes and take a picture with us at the end. Uh, except if you don't want to be in social media, then take the picture, but let us know. And he's coming. Tuk, 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 tuk. Thank you. We'll come back, come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the end of the event. Before we actually give the last applause, we have three announcements to give very quickly. Always if you ask questions, you want to sponsor us, you want to give a talk, you can always contact us. We are always available at Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, email, YouTube chat. Just, you know, don't hesitate to contact us. Genau, bevor wir jetzt beenden, drei kurze ähm, Anmerkungen, die wir noch geben möchten. Also die erste ist, wenn ihr uns kontaktieren möchtet, wenn ihr Fragen habt, astronomische Art, irgendwelche andere Art, wenn ihr auch einen Vortrag geben möchtet über ein astronomisches Thema, dann kontaktiert uns. Auf allen sozialen Medien, uh, per E-Mail, und unserem YouTube-Chat, wie auch immer ihr möchtet. Yeah. Second to last. So, we are always here the last Tuesday of every month at Fiddlers. We're very happy to have you here. If you have any ideas for events, please let us know. And uh, we wait for you on the next event on 27th of May, I believe. Genau, unser nächstes Event ist am 28. Mai. Um sieben hier ähm, mit zwei Sprechern, Professor Dr. Thomas Reibrich und Dr. James McKee, die über 
dunkle Energie und Pulsare reden werden. So, we will have two talks, one by Professor Thomas Reiprich and one by Dr. James Nangi, one about pulsars and one about dark energy, so dunkle Energie. And that's the end, which is the last announcement. Thank you for coming. We are very happy to have you and now we can clap and let's go to party into May. Genau, viel Spaß bei euren Partys. Uh, we have a, a request by Fiddlers. Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, but there is a party after us, and we were asked to vacate this room uh, after the end of the show. So we will take our photos and we will kindly leave the room so they can prepare for the next party. Thank you very much and have a good night. <laughs>